are listening to the really useful podcast. This is the tech podcast for technophobes from makeusoft.com. We've got the latest uh, tech news that matters, tips, tricks, and recommendations. With me, Christian Corley. Welcome to the show. This week I am hosting alone, although you will hear some familiar voices a little bit later on. In the meantime, let's crack on with the news. You may know that uh, a little while ago, Microsoft came under fire from its uh, browser competitors after it made it very difficult for them to be installed in Windows 11. If you installed Firefox or Chrome or or Brave, whatever, uh, it's difficult to switch from the default browser Edge, which meant that Edge would load up most of the time. Microsoft were then forced to make it easier for the other browsers to install uh the thing is that it isn't really that much easier as such the compete competing browser owners and developers aren't very happy about it um vivaldi uh john von teschner says it has always been our stance that microsoft and others like them should make it easy for users to choose to use the products that suit them this should apply to all users not just the ones who are technically competent enough to realise that they need to install an optional update and know how to actually do so. It should be installed for all users. While they have made an attempt, the fact that it has been done the way it has leads to the assumption that it is only being done to avoid being prosecuted for anti-competitive behaviour, not to actually solve the underlying problem. Mozilla, similarly unhappy about it, because what Microsoft has done is made it easier to use other browsers, but only if you install an optional update to Windows. Microsoft really wants people to use its Edge browser. It's suffered for years and years and years with the bad reputation that Internet Explorer had. Internet Explorer was kind of abandoned by Microsoft for a time as well before it switched to Edge. So you can kind of understand where they're coming from, but they still have to make it an option for other browsers to be installed. Now, there was a time when you install Windows, you launch it for the first time, you get a new PC and you launch Windows for the first time, you get the opportunity to choose which browser you wish to use. This is in the Internet Explorer days. Microsoft seems to have got around that by not using Internet Explorer anymore. Internet Explorer was integral to the workings whether by accident or design, of early versions of the Windows desktop. And when they moved away from Internet Explorer and moved away from those older Windows uh, architectures, uh, the the Edge browser comes along and it's basically based on the same technology as the Chrome browser. Even so, Microsoft really do need to do better here. Microsoft Edge is doing really well. So if they want to maintain good feeling towards this browser, it's kind of important that Microsoft plays ball and makes it easy for people to install the browser that they prefer to use. Now, our next news story is also about Microsoft. You may or may not be aware of the Surface Laptop Go. It is a budget laptop with the Microsoft Surface branding. It did really well over the past few years, uh, mainly due to people changing their working behaviours and working from home or working or hot desking. And the key thing about it is that it featured a special version of Windows, Windows 10S. Windows Central, which has a good track record for insider information that eventually turns out to be the case, uh, has uh, discovered that there is a new Surface Laptop Go in the works. It's got the code name Zuma, but it's expected to simply be called Surface Laptop Go 2 upon release. Their source says, my own sources say the Surface Laptop Go 2 will begin shipping in the first half of this year, likely sometime in June if plans don't change. Historically, Microsoft uses the spring period to ship minor refreshes of its products, so it makes sense for a Surface Laptop Go 2 to be announced during this time. 
It's rumoured to come with just a small uh, spec and the entry level model will cost around $549, although the advanced one will set you back $899. A standard Surface laptop will cost you at least $500 more than that. It's an exciting development from Microsoft. Their hardware has uh, had a, a strange <laughs> reputation over the years. The Zune MP3 player was an excellent piece of kit, but it was abandoned by Microsoft. The Windows Phone, again, pretty good, certainly in the early days, but laterly, uh, latterly abandoned by Microsoft. On the other hand, you've got the Xbox and the Xbox 360 and the Xbox One and the Xbox Series more recently, which have been very successful products. And the Surface tablets and the Surface laptops have all done really well. So this looks like a good development in that direction. That's the news done. Let's get on with some tips and tricks. When we record the really useful podcast in usual circumstances, it's either myself and Ben Stegner or myself and Gavin Phillips, we usually over-record, which means there's usually conversations that are left out of the edit. These are things that we're scheduled to talk about, but other aspects of the show have just taken too long and we like to keep the show around at most 45 minutes preferably 30 to 45 minutes and we rarely go to the hour the result is that we've got loads of things that we haven't used these are discussions between myself christian corley ben stegner who you recognize by his american accent and gavin phillips he's british like myself the following discussions will tell you about uh, how to deal with lockups in windows 10 how you can turn your phone into a PC and some thoughts about Windows XP. I mentioned just now Microsoft Word and how I feel it's improved in the browser. Another version of Microsoft Word that I've noticed is improved considerably is the uh, the app version. And I've, I've used it quite a few times uh, on Android I think we have a uh, Microsoft 365 package and I'm pretty sure my wife has a Microsoft Word installed on her iPad. Also, I've used it on Microsoft's uh, Windows Phone platform back in the day uh, when I could pretty much use my phone as more or less a PC quite a lot. Now, this is something that anyone can actually do. You don't actually need an old phone to be able to do that. You can turn your phone into a PC almost literally into a PC. Uh, all, all that's missing is a magic wand, basically. All you need is a Bluetooth keyboard and mouse, although if you have a USB keyboard and mouse, you're going to need a USB OTG cable to do this anyway. So you just need a supporting wireless HDMI display or screen mirroring system or a dock with support for HDMI, USB and SD cards. An example might be the Anki USB C seven in one hub. You also need a phone that has USB. It doesn't need to have USB C necessarily, although that is better. But it does need to have USB three point one. USB or USB three, but USB two is no good for uh, HDMI. Now there's um, five five or six different ways you can do this. The first is Samsung devices already have a thing called DeX desktop mode. That's D E X mode. Uh, Samsung Galaxy S and uh, Samsung Galaxy S8, I should say, and later devices, but it has to be a Samsung Galaxy S. Uh, that includes phones and tablets. They have um, DeX built in. It's basically a desktop environment that's running on Android. It's really good. Another way to do this is use your smartphone as a Linux PC by installing Ubuntu Touch. Now, this can be a bit complicated for most users, and there's only a small number of phones, including the OnePlus One, the Fairphone 2, and the Volophone that will run a unbutton to touch. If you're the sort of person who's likely to do that, you may also be interested in Maru OS, which is a Android fork. Again, it's limited to just a few models, uh, specifically the Nexus 5 from 2013, the Nexus 5X from 2015, and the Nexus 6P, or the original Google Pixel phones. You can also just use a desktop launcher app on Android and use that instead. You can also just simply use your Android phone as a desktop by plugging it, uh, 
plugging in a Chromecast to your TV and then setting up a sync with that stream directly to there and maybe combine that with using the desktop launcher app that I just mentioned. But if you did happen to have an old Windows phone knocking about three devices have a piece of software called Continuum built in, which lets you do the same sort of thing. It turns your Windows phone into a desktop computer. You connect it to a display and you get a, a standard Windows desktop environment. The HP Elite 3, the Lumia 950 and the Lumia 950 XL. Those are both Nokia branded phones. I've tried Continuum and I've, I even retain a phone on the off chance that if all my computers break, I can grab the phone. I can grab this old Lumia and plug it in and use it. As a, as a sort of disaster, disaster computer, basically. I think that's something every one of us tech writers have. It's like, <laughs> if my keyboard failed, if my mouse failed, what would I do in the meantime? And you have some weird contingency plan. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> would you fancy trying any of those out? I don't think I have tried them out. Whether I would, um, I've never been a Samsung person, so I probably wouldn't use Dex. Um, I think it'd be cool to try one of the Linux ones, but the limited phones are kind of a shame. I actually do have a couple of those phones. The Nexus 5 was my second Android smartphone, and yeah. I have the original Pixel still. I mean, they're just kind of sitting around. Um, oh, no, I think I turned the Pixel in when I got a Pixel 3. I'm trying to remember, but I still have my Nexus 5. Um I just, as I said before, I just, I love my desktop so much that I probably wouldn't use these unless it was a last ditch thing, but I do think they're a cool option. I think of all of them, the best one is the Samsung. It just feels more complete. The, the, the Windows one's okay, but the problem with it is obviously that those phones came out six or seven years ago and they haven't been updated since about 2018. So you're going to have security issues there, potentially. The Samsung sure, ones, and... Sorry, go on. They're probably going to just not work very well after a while since it's kind of a legacy thing anyway, yeah, exactly, right? exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I think the Samsung option is the best one. I'm looking forward to trying Linux again soon, uh, uh, Ubuntu Touch specifically, I should say, with a, a phone I'm hoping to get shortly. But uh, I can't really give you much more information on that. Well, we'll move on. However, how can you fix a Windows 10 freeze up? Uh, this is what happens when Windows 10 freezes when you're in the middle of doing something and it stops responding or it slows right down to an absolute crawl. There are various things you can do to stop this from happening. It's very difficult to get out of it, but once you do get out of it, you can prevent it from happening uh, by checking various things. And this is Windows 10 uh, specifically we're talking about, though I imagine a lot of this can also apply to Windows 11, Gavin. Uh, yeah, um, having glanced through the list, these definitely all apply to Windows 11 as well. So you can take any of the tips in the list, uh, which Christian will pop in the uh, description for the for the podcast, and you can apply them to both. Yeah, I would. I mean, it's largely software stuff, but I'm intrigued because none of it ap appears. Or maybe we can get this updated. None of this appears to apply to the browser. I suppose the low memory issues probably would cover the browser things so i know with um with older systems and uh some slower browsers or even modern browsers very updated browsers on older systems things like um google street view can cause a lockup so... yeah yeah definitely uh i would also add to that as well um aside from the great tips in this list that we'll go through um cleaning your computer dust yes all that build up in your fans and all that sort of stuff is another thing that can lead to not just a windows 10 or a windows 11 machine this can be a mac a linux console a linux laptop anything like that if it if it gets built up it can overheat and it will yeah. freeze oh and a, and a games console as well oh yeah games consoles especially because you actually if you think about where you keep your games console sort of uh in your living room sort of in a corner and that's where all the dust in your house sort of does tend to migrate to, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So um, in terms of Windows 10, you can run a malware scan, which you can do with uh, the built-in tools of uh, Microsoft, uh, I've forgotten its name, Microsoft Defender, Windows Defender. Uh, you can run a system file checker scan as well. You can clear temporary files from Windows. You can check your hard disk for malfunctions or other issues. Uh, 
if you're still using a hard disk though uh, I think at this stage you really should be thinking about switching that to a solid state drive regardless um, you can uh, disable fast to start up which can uh, be a bit of a problem for performance on Windows 10 check your Windows power management settings as well you would not believe the number of times Windows just does things slowly because you've actually told it to in the power management settings uh, you can reset Windows if you're still experiencing problems as well and as mentioned you can inspect low memory issues and you know that might be that you've got bad memory or unsuitable memory or just not enough which you can then expand with a similar type of memory module um yeah they're good tips those and as gavin mentions they will be included in the show notes where you'll be able to refer to them in greater detail if you're experiencing windows 10 freezes and lockups <laughs> When I first started using Microsoft Windows, I was simultaneously still using a Commodore Amiga 1200, and I had to kind of transition very carefully into the Windows world, which is silly, really, because I'd previously, I'd, you know, I'd, I was pretty familiar with the uh, Archimedes as well. Completely irrelevant, but there you go. Anyway, <laughs> um, and we in those days it was Windows uh, 95, but it wasn't long, and then Windows 98. But before I got my very own computer. Um, when that came around, it was almost straight into Windows XP. And for me, like a lot of people, Windows XP is very much a, a kind of a rite of passage into the uh, world of grown-up computing. It's 20 years old, though, Ben. It's older than that. It came out in October 2001, so it's a little over 20, 20 years old. 21 years old, nearly. Wow. It's so, it, it's still like, in, it's weird, too. It's still in the back of my head. This probably just because the time I grew up, but it's still so easy to think like, Windows 7 was like the last version and XP is like a little old, but still not that old. And then you think about, well, what, yeah. so yeah, Windows 95 was 95, obviously. So 20 years later would have been when Windows 10 came out. So XP is now older than 95 was when Windows 10 came out. That's crazy. That is crazy. Uh, Windows XP made, um, it sort of took all the ideas of Windows 95 and 98 and ignored everything that happened with ME and made a uh, more interesting, easier to use user experience. It supported all the new games. And, you know, I mean, I worked in um, desktop support for quite some time from the uh, early to the late 2000s. Windows XP was kind of a uh, constant of that. I remember there was a lot of resistance to uh, Windows Vista. Uh, when rollout started happening and in some cases windows vista was uninstalled and windows xp replaced uh, because things didn't work and windows xp was a very reliable operating system and while it kind of required you to have the service packs installed for and um, certainly service pack one for the very best experience uh, because it uh, did need a bit of patching uh, uh, certainly early on it it just did everything right. And I think that's probably one of the reasons why it is so popular and so well remembered because it it looked good, it felt of the time, and it didn't really have any major problems. Any major problems could be dealt with with patching or just better better kind of methods and practices. It didn't have you know, looking at it now, you know, you wouldn't install it now. It's not up to the standards of a modern operating system, but for the time, it was exactly what everyone needed. And it helps with productivity in ways that uh, we haven't seen since, really, I don't think. Yeah, I think one of the, I think looking, the reason it's so easy to look back on uh, visually, I think it still looks pretty good. Um, when I was doing research for this article, I, I saw that a lot of critics at the time said that it looked like a Fisher Price operating system, like it looked like it was made for kids. Um, but I don't really agree, honestly. Like, I think the color scheme still looks good and like the classic start button. Um, it's, it's, it's the oldest version of windows that doesn't have that just like gray, like the, with that, like dark green background, like anything ME and older just, ha just feels old. Whereas yeah. windows XP feels like something from this century. Um, and I, I, I was, it was interesting to think how much of windows XP is still, not present in newer versions exactly, but like the system tray is basically the same. The taskbar is a little bit different, but it's basically the same. Um, I use the start menu replacement and it still kind of uses that same like two column design. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think search is the biggest thing that is really, really improved. Like the, the biggest thing that comes to my mind immediately. Um, but it is funny how you can kind of just still click around Windows XP and it doesn't feel like you're using something from 20 plus years ago too strongly. I mean, if, if, you, if I was using it as my main OS, obviously, but just clicking around <laughs> in a virtual machine doesn't feel too archaic. That's really interesting. Now, we were talking about system requirements earlier, so let's have a look at Windows XP system requirements. Uh, all you would need is a 300 megahertz Pentium processor. Good luck finding one. Uh, 128 megabytes of RAM. Good luck finding something that small. Uh, 1.5 <laughs> gigabytes of storage space, a CD-ROM drive, and 800 by 600 display resolution. That's less than your phone. I mean, that's not Probably even... less than your microwave. <laughs> yeah, that was back when displays were like <laughs> your microwave. That's about that's back when displays weren't like sixteen nine like they are now. Yeah, because that's not even like I was gonna say that's like four eighty p, but that's not even like a. Well, like I a mean, it was released for CRTs yeah. as well, wasn't it? Because, right, you know, right. Yeah, we all had old TV style uh, displays in those days. So uh, yeah, it's um, it's nice to look back at it and just it it was it. I mean, you know, it was easy to fix problems with. And it had it supported remote desktop, and yeah, it's uh, it's kind of it's a nostalgia, isn't it? Yeah, it, it definitely system is. nostalgia. It is for me. So like like my the first I think our first family computer had Windows ninety eight on it, but that was like before I really used a computer much. The first computer at our house I can remember using regularly myself had XP on it. Um, most of the computers I had in school growing up through pretty much all of high school had Windows XP on them. So like I just, it was just what I used. So like the wallpapers and the icons and the sounds, of course, are so nostalgic for me. Like I was opening up the sounds and just having a great time um, hearing like the alert sound and all that because it just takes me back to using that for such a long period of my life because it, it was around for so long. Like sure. you said, Vista came out and it had stricter requirements and people weren't really happy with it. So I think a lot of people that still had Windows XP thought, well, why would I upgrade to that? Which kind of gave it a longer life than it would have had otherwise, perhaps. It upset a lot of uh, companies that use their uh, in-house software, um, the user access, uh, user account control. It uh, messed up a lot of things for that, which is why a lot of people ended up going back to XP. XP def definitely, I did mention this in the article too, definitely had some security issues though. Yeah. Um, like basically every piece of software just assumed that you were an administrator account. So if you were using a limited account, which was what they called a standard account back then, like a lot of stuff would just fail. So most people just made an admin account and just used that all the time, which yeah. obviously leads to problems because if malware yeah, gets on, exactly. yeah, it just has full permissions. Plus that was the last version of Windows that had the default administrator account with no password which is obviously extremely insecure because if you know that's there, you can just log into it and just do whatever you want. So obviously Microsoft learned from that and that's where user account control was too far in the other direction. And then with Windows 7, that finally kind of hit its happy middle ground. <laughs> well, we're getting towards the end of this really useful podcast with me, Christian Corley. And if you haven't already subscribed to the show on Apple Podcasts or whatever you use for listening to podcasts, please do so as it helps us raise awareness of the show, helps to increase the audience. If you share it even, that does the same job. If you're also able to leave us a review on whatever podcasting service you use as well and then let us know that you've left a review, we'll read it out. And thanks in advance for doing so. As mentioned elsewhere in this show, Everything we discuss in the Really Useful podcast is available in the show notes. So if we've said something that you're interested in, head to the show notes, click the relevant link, and you can read more about it. Now, it's recommendations time, and it is, as you've noticed, just me this week. I've recently reviewed a kind of a computer. It's not really a computer. It's a slimmed-down revival of a classic computer, uh, like the NES Classic or the Sega Genesis Mini. It's the A500 Mini, a small 10-inch device that resembles an Amiga 500, a computer first released in around 1987. This computer is an emulation system. It will play games for the Amiga 500, the Amiga 600, and the Amiga 1200. You're looking at around 
12 years worth of game in there. Possibly more either side. I reviewed it from makeusoft.com, so you can have a look at the full review via the link in the show notes. I just have this to say about it. I've discussed the uh, Evercade retro gaming system previously on the show, and what I like about that is how simple it makes playing classic games. It's the same with the A500 Mini. You, it takes about five minutes at the maximum to get out the box, put it together, power it up, and start playing a game. There are 25 classic Amiga games built into this system. There's a load more that you can get hold of as well. In fact, the uh, company that's published it, uh, Retro Games Limited, they even make an extra game available on their website to help you use the uh, expansion option, which is uh, putting games on a USB stick. It's uh, got multiplayer support, although there aren't too many games with multiplayer in there, but there's plenty of other multiplayer options, and there are three USB ports. And ultimately, it's just a really good way to do game emulation without messing around with all the settings. Because that is the big pain about emulation. But a system like this, everything's pre-configured. If you need to make changes to the controller, you can. You can use any controller you like, although it does ship with a uh, gamepad and a mouse the mouse itself is uh, very similar to the original Amiga mouse. And if you're interested in 16-bit gaming, whether you were there the first time around or you're interested now looking back, uh, this is a great option. It isn't too expensive either, and I would heartily recommend it. I've had a great bit of fun with it. I found games that I never played either because they were difficult to get hold of in my neck of the woods or I just didn't fancy them at the time. I've played them. I've also revisited a few that I did enjoy a lot, and... Strangely found I got better at them. I was really expecting the opposite. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in the A500 Mini, it's not yet out in the United States. It is out in the UK and Europe, which is how I've been able to play it. And, uh, yeah, check it out. If that is your thing, go and get yourself one. It's really good, simple to use, and you'll be gaming in minutes. Sadly, I don't have any other recommendations this week from my co-hosts. So that brings us to the end of the show. Thanks for listening as ever, to the really useful podcast from makeuseof.com. We'll see you next time. Goodbye.